So good to be with you guys this morning. We're being in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to start in verse 1. So 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. Saul is the first king of Israel. And Samuel is the prophet at the time. And the Lord is speaking to him about a transition in leadership. Samuel is upset because of decisions Saul has made. He is mourning in his heart for the leadership of Israel. But the Lord speaks to him and says, Now that's enough. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. I have selected one of his sons to be my king. For those of you who might not know, the son that God had selected from the line of Jesse was a young boy named David. David, son of Jesse. David, son of Jesse. We're going to spend time, like I'd mentioned, talking about David. But whenever I think of David, I often think of a story. I heard Dr. Mark Rutland, who is an incredible, incredible father of the faith for us in uh, Protestant Christianity. He is such a profound speaker and a leader. And if you're familiar with academia, he has been the president of so many phenomenal Christian universities. And those are getting harder and harder to find these days. But Dr. Mark Rutland decided he was going to write a book on the life of King David. And in his research and in his study for the book, he decided that one of the best ways he could go to kind of learn the geography, to learn the, the places David went, was to actually go and see them in Israel. So he went over to Israel a number of years ago. And in his touring and in his going around and asking questions, a woman stopped him and said, what, what are you doing in Israel? And he said, I'm researching a book about King David, the son of Jesse, the second king of Israel. And the woman stopped him and she grabbed him and she looked at him frustrated and kind of shocked and said, why would you write a book about such a bloody man? And Dr. Mark Rutland tells a story laughing because he says, I knew right then that this was a book worth writing. Because anybody who can cause that much emotion 4,000 years after they died is worth writing about. And King David is one of those men. He is such a a multifaceted man, a man with a lot of layers, a man with a lot of imperfections, a man with an incredible story that we get to see pretty much from his youth to his old age. And in the Bible, that's not always the case. Sometimes figures will pop up for a moment and we don't hear much about them. But David, we hear so much of his story and we get to glean so much from it. But when you start to talk about David, the first place that we see him is in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and it is talking about his anointing. And before we get to David as king, or David as the rebel, or David as the outcast, or David as the adulterer, or David as the giant slayer, before we get anywhere, some people know David by another name. And we get that name from Acts 13 verse 22. Some people know David best for what the Bible says about him here in Acts 13:22. But God removed Saul and replaced him with David, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. A man after my own heart. There are only a few things when I get to heaven that I hope the Lord says about me. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You are a man after my own heart heart. My goodness, let it all be said of us that we are men and women after God's own heart. And they, the Bible says it about David. David, who we see so much uh, complication in his life, is a man after God's own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. It says in Acts 13 verse 22, David was a man after God's own heart. His relationships, his choices, his triumphs, his failures, all of it is compiled in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, it refers back to him as a man after God's own heart. My goodness. But before we get into all of David's story, before we talk through his triumphs, his failures, successes, and shortcomings, we're going to talk about David's anointing. We're going to talk about David's anointing. He was anointed. He was an anointed man. And before we go any further, I remember, you'll remember, uh, that I said I'd be in rooms like this and I'd hear people say things like, the presence of God is in this room. I'd also hear people use what I call Christianese. 
Christianese is language that only Christians use that doesn't make a lot of sense to people who aren't Christians. There's tons of words you can think of, but one of them is this word, anointing. Now, it does have a meaning, and the actual meaning of the word anoint is ceremonially conferred divine or holy office upon, now usually a priest or a monarch, by smearing or rubbing with oil. Another definition is to set apart, to empower, or protect. So anointing is to ceremonially confer divine purpose upon a priest or a monarch normally. That's the definition of the word anoint. Now in Christianity, we've kind of complicated it and we've put our own spin on the word and we say it in sentences and we'll get into that in a moment. But in biblical terms, the actual meaning is that somebody would take oil. Now, there were different types of oil for different types of situations, and they would take the oil and either pour it or they would smear it on someone. And again, it would infer that this person was set apart for something or this thing was set apart for a purpose. They would do it to sacrifices. They would do it to priests. They would do it to kings. And so it meant that God had a divine purpose. It was symbolic that there is a purpose for this thing, and it is anointed for this purpose. And that's what the anointing meant in Scripture. And it was to prepare someone, someone for something. And people would understand that when you saw someone anointed or when Samuel shows up, the prophet of God shows up with oil on his person to the house of Jesse, there's an implied understanding that something is about to happen. Someone is about to be anointed in this way, inferred with divine purpose or called to a divine plan. And that's what people understood. And Anointing in the Old Testament is what Pastor Doug and many refer to as a type and a shadow. A type and a shadow, which means in the Old Testament, it is a glimpse of something, a shadow of something that is revealed and brought into the light in the New Testament through the new covenant of Jesus. Now, anointing in the Old Testament, the pouring on or rubbing with oil, is a type and a shadow of something that happens in the new covenant with Jesus. And what is that thing? We'll get to that in a second. Because, like I said... We use weird words. Christians are weird. Some of us are just plain weird. None of you, absolutely none of you are weird. We're all super normal, level-headed Christians. Not a weird bone in our body. But other Christians at other churches are weird. Okay? Some of them. Not all. And they would say things. If you've ever been around Christians at big conferences or other places or in church for any length of time, they'll say things like, oh, they're so anointed. They're so anointed. Or, oh, that worship leader is so anointed. Or that speaker was anointed. Or that message was anointed. Or this Chick-fil-A is anointed. Hallelujah. Anointing kind of a spiritual check and balance to make sure that God has special agents wherever he wants to, whenever he wants to, and the rest of us are just kind of pawns in the game. Now, that's a question we can lean into and a lie that we can believe. It applies again directly to us. Does God pick random people to be more holy, more spiritual, more powerful, more righteous, more gifted? Does God just pick and the rest of us have got to live with our lot in life? You know, you might think, and I hear Pastor Doug tell stories, and it just blows my mind. Because he'll go to uh, restaurants, and he'll talk to waitresses or waiters, and he'll, by the end of the conversation, he'll have them crying and weeping and giving their lives to Jesus. Or he talks about how he stops on the side of the road, and he led someone to the Lord, and now he officiated or walked them down the aisle at their wedding. And it's all true, and it's incredible. But if I did that, the cops would be called. Right, If I tried to minister to somebody, I I don't have the same gifts and talents. I could take all the public speaking or the personal uh, interpersonal relationship classes in the world and I'd never be Pastor Doug. And I could take all, I could take singing lessons from angels and never lead worship like Lily or Casey or Clay or Ashley or anybody up here. I would be horrible. Nobody would come to this church and it would be terrible for everyone. And so they're just better than me or, you know, is anything that could, that we could say, we could point around the room and go, well, they're just better. They're just set apart by God. They're just picked because they're, God likes them more than me. <laughs> is that actually the, the truth? There was a study uh, done a number of years ago, and then a, a man named Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book based upon the findings of this study. The book is called Outliers. This book, Outliers, was an ex- exploration of success. What makes successful people the best? What makes the very best, the very tip-top of any field, the very tip-top? What happens there? And he wanted to know, is there some, ge- 
excuse me, genetic trait? Is there some uh, random timeline? That because all around the same age they all started? Or did they all have a certain uh, discipline that they were into? Were they all meditating? What happened? How, what was the common denominator between all of these exceptional people? Uh, was there something, some sort of similarity between Bill Gates and Muhammad Ali and Lionel Messi and Adele and all of the best of the best of the best? And, and what he found, the groundbreaking earth-shattering discovery that he made was that the secret weapon, the, the mysterious, unlockable trait was time and effort. Amount of time spent doing something and how hard somebody tried. It wasn't genetics, it wasn't finances, it wasn't situations, it wasn't experience, it was how hard they worked and how much time they spent on it. That's what separated the best from the very best, from the very top. And when we're looking at biblical figures, when we're looking at Christianity, when we're looking at spirituality, the same is true. The anointing of God is not some set off, far away thing for the only spiritual elite to achieve. God is saying, if you will put in the time and the effort, I have an anointing for you. God anointing is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is for everyone. And uh, the, my, one of my favorite authors, his name is Brandon Sanderson, he put it this way, heroism, and you can substitute anointing for the word heroism in this quote, is often the seemingly spontaneous result of a lifetime of preparation. So we see someone, we go, oh, they're so anointed. Oh, Lily's so anointed. Oh, Pastor Doug is so anointed. A lifetime has been spent preparing for your random spontaneous anointing to show up. God is putting, he's wondering, is, are people willing to put in the time, put in the effort? Is, are people wanting to know me like few will, will know me and I will touch their lives like few people's lives have been touched? There is a give and take and, and the anointing of God is so powerful for us to lean into. The anointing is for everyone. If you're wondering if you can be used by God, if you're wondering if you can be a man or a woman after God's own heart, if you're wondering if God has special plans for you, the anointing of God is for everyone, for everyone. It's for everyone, all of us in the room, whether you have a microphone and are standing behind this table, or if you have a mic in your hand and lead worship, or if you greeted at the door, or if you've come in for the first time today and sat down, there's an anointing for you. The anointing of God is for everyone. And no one is mighty or anointed by accident. Nobody has fallen into it just because God picked them because it's just a random thing that God did. There is time and effort, and we're going to talk about anointing right now. So one point about anointing, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. Anointing is based on private proximity, not public perspective. Anointing is based on private proximity, not public perspective. And I know what you're thinking. That's a great alliteration. Thank you so much for noticing. Thank you. Private proximity, not public perspective. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Eliab is the eldest son of Jesse. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This is very tricky when we talk about spirituality, when we talk about life, because it's easy to look at someone and think, oh, they have got it all together. I wish I was like so-and-so. It's easy to look at somebody else's marriage or somebody else's kids and think, oh, I wish my kids were like so-and-so's kids. I wish my husband was like so-and-so's husband. I wish my wife was like so-and-so's wife. I wish I had the financial situation that so-and-so has. I wish I grew up like so-and-so. If only my life were different, then things would be better. And I, if only that, that must be what it really takes. And if we're not careful, we fall into exactly what Samuel the prophet did when he saw Eliab. Samuel the prophet looks at someone, his perspective is shown on someone, and he goes, well, that must be what the anointed looks like. That must be God's anointed. That must be the one. He looks at a situation, he looks at a person, he looks at a thing, and he goes, that's what anointing looks like. And God goes, and he says the same thing to all of us who confuse comparison for God's anointing. He says, hold on. 
I don't look at the outside. You can't see what my anointing looks like because I look at the heart. I look at the heart. It's not how they look, it's their heart. Some of us get so discouraged because of how we look, because of how a situation looks. And God says, it doesn't matter, how's the heart? Can you hear my heart? Can you hear my voice? Can you hear my words? Are you close enough to me? Are you, are you in proximity to me? I apologize in advance. You're bored of me talking about the Olympics. I get it, but this is the last week, so this is, I promise, we'll only talk about it again in four years. But here it is, the last Olympics metaphor that I will make for you all in this Olympic cycle, unless a better one comes to mind. So, in the 100-meter dash, uh, the men's 100-meter dash, they had the closest finish they've ever had, and an American named Noah Lyles won first place by five thousandths of a second. That's a decimal point, and then the third place is a five. So not tens, hundredths, he won by five thousandths of a second. And just to try to articulate how close that is, I'm going to say go, and then I'm going to say stop after five thousandths of a second. Go stop. I didn't do it. That was too, I was too slow. Go stop. It's almost impossible for us to really understand. It was so impossible to determine that they had to use new technology to figure out how close it was. And this is a picture of the final run. He is the one there in the middle, uh, bottom. His chest is crossing the second, the farthest red line. And the second place guy is in yellow, third from the top. Five thousandths of a second between winning and second. And you might think, how is this going to tie in? Well, we have to be close to God. We have to have our own presence, or God's own presence for us. We have to own our closeness, our anointing. The Spirit of God needs to dwell in us personally. They unveiled technology at the Olympics in 2012, and they decided that there was an unfair advantage for the runners who were inside on the track because when the gun went off, the sound of the gun was heard on the inside and then sound traveled to the outside and the guys on the outside had a disadvantage because the sound got to them later than the guys on the inside and a lot of us thought, who cares? Are you, you're just fooling yourselves if you think that's ever going to matter. Well, Noah Lyles wins the 100 meter dash by five thousandths of a second and somebody did the math. They took the, the sound of the gun and they put an individual speaker in every starting block. And so everyone hears at the exact same time. And if they had not done that, the sound of the gun to go from where the second place finisher was to where Noah Lyles was would have taken seven thousandths of a second to get to Noah Lyles, which meant that Noah Lyles would have lost, would have come in second by two thousandths of a second. The fact that he was on his own with his own speaker and not listening to a far-off sound made the difference between gold and silver medal. And all of you are nodding. You can understand what I'm saying. Because you shouldn't have to wait from Sunday to Sunday to be able to hear the presence of God. Yes, if you're going to clap, let's clap. You shouldn't have to wait for a speaker to tell you or for someone else to tell you or for a worship song to come on. You shouldn't have to wait for the sound to travel from somebody else's presence, from somebody else's anointing to your ears. We should have our own locked in, close enough to hear a whisper, presence and anointing of God. Amen. 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 Anointing is based on private proximity, not public perspective. Because I'm looking at it from the outside going, who cares if there's a gun or a speaker in the block? What is it ever going to matter? And some of us are in our lives and we are getting by by thousands of a second. We are holding on for dear life and we're going, if I had to wait another moment, I'm not going to make it. I need the presence of God myself. I need the anointing of God myself. I need it right now and I can't wait. And God says, you don't have to. The presence is available if you're willing to come close enough to hear it, close enough to get it. Bless the Lord. Anointing is based on private proximity, not public perspective. The next point, anointing is based on divine purpose, not earthly position. Divine purpose, not earthly position. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 10 and 11. In the same way, Eliab comes up, and in the same way, 
All seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Verse 11, Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? And Jesse answers, There is still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. It's interesting the language the Bible uses. It says all seven of Jesse's sons, as if there is a grouping in the house of Jesse between his sons and then kind of a larger circle and then his sons where David is on the outside of. So all seven of the sons, and he goes, is this all you have? And Jesse says, well, there is one more, but he's so irrelevant. I didn't even call him in from the fields to come in for the sacrifice you're going to make. And Samuel says you need to call him in. But Jesse says he's out in the fields watching the sheep and the goats. David is out, disregarded, forgotten about in in the fields with the sheep and the goats. His position, though, his place, his location, did not dictate his purpose. The place he was at, out in the field with the sheep and the goats, did not dictate his divine Purpose. God had a divine purpose for David, and nothing was going to stop him from getting it. Nothing was going to stop God from giving his purpose and his anointing and his presence to David. Old, young, wealthy, broke, hurting, healthy, whether you've got a corner office or a middle cubicle, our position, it does not determine our purpose. It does not determine God's desire for us to have his presence, the anointing. The Holy Spirit does. This is a picture called Starry Night. It's one of my favorite pictures. It's one of my favorite pieces of art. And it's probably one of the more famous ones. It's very well known. A lot of uh, representations, replicas have been made. It's been placed all over and used to kind of uh, put styles on different things. You might have even seen a picture that took this style and made its own thing. And it's so prevalent because it's so well known, so famous. And the artist is a man named Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh was famously poor his entire life, even up to his death, and died very broken destitute. And uh, Vincent Van Gogh famously cut off one of his ears and uh, had to seek medical attention immediately. And he went to the doctor, and he could not pay the doctor again, broken destitute. So he did what he, only what he could. He painted the doctor a picture. Uh, he painted the doctor a picture of the doctor. He painted a portrait of this man. Vincent Van Gogh hand-painted a portrait of the doctor who he was there. And you might think, oh my goodness, yes, I'll take that payment any day. The doctor was not so appreciative. The doctor and his family thought, you know what? This painting does not look like me. I do not like this painting. The style doesn't make any sense. I don't even want this in my home. And so he and his family took Vincent Van Gogh's painting and they used it to plug a hole in their chicken coop. So they put Vincent Van Gogh's painting out in their chicken coop for over 10 years. It sat there until uh, a French soldier saw it and said, hey, can I buy that from you? And then so things bounced around. And now today, that painting is worth $50 million. I wish somebody would let me just do something where they paint me a picture that's worth $50 million. Wow. And I'd put it in my chicken coop. How ridiculous that we, uh, we see stories like this and we go, you are out of your mind. How could you possibly not understand the value? You could not understand the purpose of this thing. And, and we position it way out far away where it's not going to help us and it's not going to be of any benefit to us. And then we talk to God. And God says, I have my presence for you. I want to give you a gift. And we go, well, God, I, I'm, I'm not ready for it. Or I don't want to deal with it. Or you know what? It doesn't actually have uh, the timing that I want in it right now. And I, I want you to do something, God says. And we go, well, when I get to it, I will. And, and God's going, stop putting my presence in the chicken coop. Stop putting what I want to give you out in a useless place. But then some of us, we put ourselves in the chicken coop. We go, well, God can never use me. I'm, I'm useless. I'm too broken. I'm too lost. I'm too hurting. I'm in a place right now where I'm in healing. So until I'm actually whole and better, and I'm, per- and I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm better than I am, I'm not going to be used by God. He's never going to be able to use me. Your position does not dictate your purpose. Yeah. You have a purpose, a divine, God-given purpose. Anointing is based on divine purpose, not earthly position. It doesn't matter if people have put you in chicken coops or out in the field with the sheep or you've been abused and and these things are real and we have to seek healing. But God says it's not going to affect your purpose. 
I've still got a purpose for you. Bless the Lord. And if you want further proof that God had a purpose, even when David was out in the fields, we see a promise God makes to David after he's become king. And listen to the promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 through 16. I'll read it for you. When your days are over, this is God speaking to David. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13, he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever? Forever. Who could God be talking about? I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. God is talking to David about Jesus. God says, there is an offspring that's going to come from your line, and you can trace the line from Jesus back to David. He says, there's going to be an offspring. I'm going to be his father. He's going to be my son. And when he does wrong, God is giving a hint. Jesus never did wrong, but he took all the wrong upon him and was beaten and whipped for us. And he established Jesus' kingdom forever through the line of David. My love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. You might think, well, what does that have to do? There is a purpose for your life, and God is not calling you out of the fields to make you uncomfortable or to make your life difficult or to make your Christianity more complicated. He's calling you out of the fields because Jesus is going to come from you. Because there is somebody in the world who needs to encounter the presence of God, who needs to encounter the hope of God, who needs to encounter the Son of God. And God says, if you'll listen to my purpose, you're the one they're going to hear it from. You're the one they're going to see it from. You're the way they're going to encounter who I am. God wants to use us. He wants to use us to accomplish his purpose. And he gives us his presence to do so. Bless the Lord. Anointing, third thing, is based on spiritual status, not success. It's based on spiritual status, not success. It's not, uh, God does not have a divine ledger up in heaven and he's calculating all of the good things and all of the bad things and, and what you did yesterday and if he'll anoint you today and the accumulation of all the bad from your life and then from the moment you repented, if you did more bad and now you're not anointed, God doesn't work like that. The status of your heart, God is wondering about. Not how successful you are following his rules. Now, there is a caveat, and we're going to talk about it, but listen to Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 39. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And listen to what he says. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you get saved in earnest, humble yourselves, repent of your sins, and give your heart to Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. And that word is the same word for anointing. Spiritual status. Are you a child of God? Are you sold out for the Lord? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior and God is your Father? Well, then I guarantee, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will be your helper and he will come to live inside of you. For the promise is for you and for your children. And for all who are far off, praise God for that line because we are far off from Israel. We are in Harrison, Ohio, but the Holy Spirit is as much for us as it was for the apostles. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone who the Lord God God calls to himself, it's for everyone. Anointing is based on spiritual status, not success. You can have skills. You can have gifts. You can have talents. There have been well-known Christian leaders who are prolific and they are gifted and they go far and they seem to have incredible fruit and by God's sovereign grace he uses them but then you come to find out they haven't had the anointing at all doesn't matter about skills and gifts and talents and those things are great and God will use them but if we don't have the presence if we don't have the anointing if we're not close enough to God to hear him for ourselves if we don't believe that our purpose is greater than our position then God's saying I've got more in store in store for your life Now, I said before, it's not about success, but there is a caveat. And the caveat is, it is about obedience. Anointing and obedience are tied together. Now, it's not about success. 
God's not keeping some divine ledger like I said, but he does want obedience. He wants us to listen to him and he wants us to repent when we have failed to do so. And he ties obedience to the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself does in John 14, verse 15 and 16. You've heard me say this so many times, you're probably tired of hearing me say it. You could probably finish it if you wanted to. If you love me, obey my commands. Jesus says that. If you love me, obey my commands. But the next verse says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. And verse 17 begins, he is the Holy Spirit. If you love me, obey my commands and I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will never leave you. So you might be wondering, well, how do I get anointed? I want to be anointed. I want to be powerfully used by God. I want to be an anointed person. I want to be an anointed father. I want to be anointed husband, wife, sister, brother, son, daughter, coworker, employee. I want to be anointed in my life. Jesus says, it's simple. Do what I say. And we look at David and we go, how did he become a man after God's own heart? That's what I want. And you look at David's life that went up and down and up and down, but at every moment, David was always willing to align himself with God. He was always concerned about obedience to God. Are we doing what God has asked of us to do? I would challenge us, if we're wondering about God's anointing or why he's not using us in a more powerful way, let's look at the small things. Look at the way that we're handling our relationships. Let's look at the way that we're forgiving people who wrong us. Let's look at the way that we're handling our finances or the people God has placed in our lives, what kind of husband we are, what kind of spouse or father or mother we are, what kind of child we are. Because if you're an obedient Christian, you're anointed. And we can walk in power. And I'm not talking about power like calling lightning down from heaven. Maybe one of you can do that. I don't know. Don't do it to me. But we're talking about power that will get you through moments like Lisa described. Power that will pull you out of pits and will pull you out of problems. Power that will put wind under your wings so that you can keep going in the midst of every storm. That's the power that God has for us in this room. That's what the anointing of God is. So we're gonna spend a moment and then we'll dismiss. We'll just spend one moment. We're gonna sing the song we sang. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the Christ. Jesus is spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus. So when we talk about Jesus and we praise Jesus, the Holy Spirit's going, they're talking about us. They're talking about me. I wanna come and move in them. So we're gonna sing in just a second. But... I'd like all of us to stand for a moment, please. Please stand, if you would. So, as you're standing, I want you to have a moment with the Lord. And then after this, we're gonna just quickly ask anyone if they'd like to give their life to the Lord, if you wanna give your life to Jesus. But before we get there, I believe the Lord wants to speak. The Holy Spirit wants to move. The presence of God wants to do some work in this room. He wants to call some people out of the pastures and out of the chicken coops and out of the broken places of your life. And he wants to give you purpose and he wants to speak something to you. And he wants you to feel the touch of his presence in a tangible way. Some of us are even gonna experience bodily reactions to the Holy Spirit possibly. So if you would, I'm actually, I'm gonna say this really quickly, pardon my interruption, but some of us in here, we're thinking, well, I've never experienced anything like that. I I don't want to put my hands out. I'm not going to do anything like that. And funny enough, my daughter, uh, you you ever talk to children and you go, hey, we're going to this restaurant. What do they serve? They serve X, Y, and Z thing. And the kid, inevitably, somebody says, I don't like that. We'll say, oh, well, have you had uh, chicken fingers before? And they go, well, no, I've never had chicken fingers before. And you're like, I think you'd quite like chicken fingers. Uh, But I've never had them. I don't like them. Some of us, we just say we don't like the Holy Spirit. We don't want to experience the presence of God. We don't want to get uh, touched by the presence of God. We don't want the anointing of God. We, we don't, well, have you ever experienced it? And we go, no, 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 no. I, I would just encourage you, don't knock it until you've opened yourself up to the Lord. So if you would, would you just put your hands out as I pray right now? And then we're going to sing together. Lord, thank you for your presence. I pray right now, right now, you would 
even begin to bring fresh revelation to people's hearts. You'd begin to touch them, God, and even healing would begin in their body, in the places that they're aching, in the, the, the places of their heart that they're aching, in the places of their body they need physical healing. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would begin to move around this room right now. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the touch of God. We thank you that your people are coming, seeking your anointing, and you are a good father who wants to give good gifts. So we thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit even being bestowed upon us right now. We thank you, Jesus, for the anointing of God. We thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask you to have your way in this room right now as we enter into worship for you and to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. in this room right now and you're going, I want to give my life to Jesus. I need to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. I need to make the Father in heaven my Father on earth and I want the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God to come live inside me. If that's you anywhere in the room, would you just raise your hand right now? Right now. Amen. 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 You guys can put your hands down. Thank you so much. 
Let's pray this prayer together, church. Say, Jesus, I admit I need you. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you are the Christ. You came to this earth. You lived a perfect life. You died on the cross. You rose again, and you did it for me. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I've sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I confess them to you. I say this, I am forgiven. Say, Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Fill my life. Give me strength and courage to do what you say. Now let's end this way. Say, I am a child of God. I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. And the church, let's stay here for a second. Please stay here for a second. I know uh, some of us in here are starting to let our minds wander. Hunger is getting to us, but I, I really feel like there's an invitation. And I've been trying in my mind to get past uh, asking people down front. I really want to make it easy for you to encounter the Lord and to have a moment with Jesus. But there is something about stepping out and coming forward that you just can't get around. In the Bible, the people react to him and they come forward and they, they cast themselves before him. And this isn't, uh, you know, we're not building an idol of this altar, but there is something profound that happens when our bodies have to come into agreement with our spirit and a decision that we're making. And I'm gonna make uh, Lisa a little bit of a liar because she said, I'm not gonna make you come down front earlier, but if you raised your hand and you really do need a touch from heaven, you need an anointing from God, you need the Holy Spirit to bring a revelation or a healing or a move in your life, if that's you, we're going to sing and our prayer team is going to come down right now. But I'm just going to ask that you, if that's you, or maybe you didn't raise your hand at the beginning, but you're going, there's something. I want a touch from heaven. I need a move of God. If that's you, would you just get out of your seat and come down as we sing these words right now? Just come on down. still have a moment and if you're having a moment at your seat please you don't have to flee you don't have to get out please feel free to tarry 
For all the rest of us, would you just put your hands out on behalf of Pastor Doug, our elders, our church, myself. I just want to bless you. God, thank you for everyone in this room. Thank you for their purpose, their calling. Thank you for your anointing that is freely given to those whom would say yes and walk in obedience. Thank you, God, for all of us in this room. Thank you, Jesus, for your spirit within us if we say yes and walk in confidence. Lord, we ask that you'd bless every marriage in this room, every marriage represented, God, that you'd let laughter and unity come into every marriage. And if a spouse is not following you, we pray for their salvation, God. On behalf of all of the wayward spouses who are not with you, we believe for God to come in and to rescue their heart. Your word says that the unbelieving spouse will be made redeemed by a believing spouse. So God, wherever that balance, however the devil's lying to somebody in this room saying your spouse is never going to get it, you're fighting a losing battle. We say no in Jesus' name. There will be salvation. And we say the same thing over the prodigal sons and daughters. They will come back to you, God. There will be a day of rejoicing. Your spirit is even now drawing them in. And we stand in faith, God. Thank you for every marriage, for everyone raising children, every parent with a child in the home. Give them wisdom and strength and discernment and strategy and innovation and how they raise their children up in the way they should go so that when they're older, they do not depart from it. God, bless all our young people who are deciding and trying to figure out where you're calling them and what you're putting in their hands, what work you want them to do. God, surround them and protect them and guide them and shape them and let them link arms with people that they can run with that will keep each other accountable and fight away spirits of loneliness and isolation. God, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, bless uh, all those who are mourning, our widows and our widowers and anyone grieving the loss of a loved one. God, we thank you that your spirit, your presence, your anointing is a comforter. You are a comforter, Holy Spirit. So we ask that that characteristic, that identity of who you are would take new meaning in each of us who are grieving in any way. And Lord, we thank you that you are going to give the orphans a home in Jesus' name. Lord, all across the globe and the orphans who are spiritual orphans, who are away from you, who are not in your family, we ask that you would bring them home into the house of God. Lord, we thank you. For all our business owners, for all of us working in a missional vocation, God, we ask for uh, open opportunities, open doors to share your love with our coworkers, with our world, with the sphere that we're in, and for our business owners to have wisdom and discernment in how they lead their business. Now, would you look up at me as I bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, lift his countenance upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. Would you say this with me? In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next week. Hey, thank you so much for joining us here at Church on Fire Online. And we would love if you would follow us on our social media pages. So we look forward to seeing you next time here at Church on Fire Online, and God bless you.